From a design perspective, Nintendo has built a reputation for its gameplay-first approach. The central mechanic and playable elements of a game are chosen first and characterization and plot are built around it rather than the other way around. That is not to say the stories on some of these games are not noteworthy. Designers have worked within those constraints to deliver some fantastic examples of storytelling in plenty of Zelda games, from Ocarina of Time's subversion of Kukiri Forest as a safe area and the corruption of the marketplace as a way of representing the change to bleak adulthood, to Breath of the Wild's remarkable use of out-of-order memories as cutscenes to tell a story in a game that the player can do in any order. But what happens on the rare moments where the gameplay is not the absolute first concern? What happens when the first thing a Zelda game tries is to make you feel something? Hi, I'm your host, Alex. Let's take a deep dive into the opening hours of The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. First levels of a Zelda game are a window into their design sensibilities, techniques and priorities at the time of development. May it be an introduction to a new type of play, trying to overdo both learning and storytelling, or perfecting the idea of a safer vertical slice. They all tend to focus primarily on introducing players to the mechanics of the game, with one exception. The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. Majora's Mask is the exception for many things in the Zelda franchise. While the tone of other games is usually dramatic and more heroic, Majora's Mask stands alone as frightening, ominous and dark. While it features the same open-world temple-exploring basic gameplay loop, it is mixed together with a unique take on time-traveling mechanics that very few games before had tried. Given its anxiety-inducing world-ending premise and its plot focus on regret in the face of imminent doom, it is not a surprise that Majora's Mask has a very unique introductory level. On a previous video, I commented on a lot of the fascinating design decisions done by the opening hours of Ocarina of Time, that assume that the player might be unused to the idea of 3D movement. As Zelda games have progressed, they assume an increased level of game literacy from the player, all the way to Breath of the Wild, which very reasonably expects the player to know how an open-world game works and instead focuses on teaching the player the mechanics of its uniquely connected systems. Majora's Mask was specifically developed as a follow-up to what was at the time the most colossal success of a Zelda game. It was developed under the challenge of not only appealing to the same audience and continuing the story of the same protagonist, but to release relatively quickly after its predecessor. So coming into this game, the designers work under one strong assumption, that most players of Majora's Mask had played Ocarina of Time before. You don't even have to take my word for this, Aonuma has explicitly said so before. And you can also see this later in the game from the enemy text from Todd, your fairy companion, while well, Nabi of Ocarina of Time will be direct in explaining what she knew about an enemy, if the player asks. In Majora's Mask, if the player asks about an enemy that was already common in Ocarina of Time, Tot will often be more aggressive and point out that the player should already know some of this. Now the interesting thing is that this assumption of previous knowledge is then used to take the players into an unexpected direction. Look at it this way. Ocarina of Time opens up with a slightly somber tone with the Great Deku Tree, the protector spirit of the forest, commenting on the coming of a great evil, and follows up with an immediately more light-hearted awakening of the hero, followed by a level that has beautiful and uplifting music and gives players time to properly come to their bearings and get equipped for their challenge. Majora's Mask it starts with the same hero lost in the forest with really mysterious music and immediately gets knocked out while the main billion, presented with one of the spookier themes ever heard in a Zelda game, and as soon as Link recovers, the enemy runs away with Epona and the Ocarina of Time and you have to give chase. Well, the music for the start of Ocarina of Time is This is the Hidden Forest, we're all children of the forest and we live carefree lives with fairies. The music for the start of Majora's Mask is like What are you doing? He just ran away with your most precious possession! Go after him! Holy sh- <laughs> If you ignore the music and take a second to get your bearings, there's literally nothing to interact with except a bunch of plants to cut. In terms of his base helium form, Link in Majora's Mask is almost identical to how he was in Ocarina of Time, and it does not take more than a couple of swings at the plants to make this obvious. This is Link as we left him in Ocarina of Time. No quest to get a sword or a shield, no guidance on how to do anything. Mm, almost. So far, I have been using footage from the 3DS remakes of Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask for the sake of clarity, since they are a bit easier to read for a modern audience. 
Ocarina of Time 3D is almost identical to the original Nintendo 64 game except for a few quality of life improvements and the improved visuals. Majora's Mask 3D takes more liberties, and that is a huge topic for another day, but for today they added a sign at the intro section that goes, you probably already know this, but here's how to move and do things. This was not an original game, so I'm kinda going to ignore it, alright? Where was I? Oh yeah. After complete assumption that the player is familiar with Link and his movement and absolutely no guidance on the basics, the first proper interactable area are these mushrooms that require a bit of platforming. Whoa, wait, what was that? Mechanically and animation-wise, Link in Majora's Mask is nearly identical to Ocarina of Time, with one really big exception, jumping. Mechanically, jumping works the same in this game, but visually, if the distance between Link and the landing platform is just right, he will trigger one of these fancy acrobatic jumping animations. This does not happen often, and is in fact kinda special when you find a place where it happens consistently. So it is super interesting that the very first platform of the game triggers the acrobatic jump. Is this the developers showing up some of the fancy stuff they have added? Probably, but there is more. On interviews for the development of this game, the developers speak of the switch in tone between these two games with two terms. For Ocarina of Time the main term they use is hospitality. For Majora's Mask, this switches to challenge. Hyrule in Ocarina of Time was inviting, adventurous and ready to be explored. In Majora's Mask, Termine is dangerous, challenging and a little bit hostile. How are players primed to this switch? Fancy jumping helps signal that even if he looks like a child, this is an experienced Link. This is not a child holding a piece of wood as a shield. This Link, as a surrogate of the player, is experienced, familiar and comfortable with their existing abilities. Even if the music is alarming, you know what to do and how to react. The experienced player and Link are in a similar state of mind. A lot of players easily catch on to the subtext from the animations all the time. Which is why immediately you fall down the rabbit hole, quite literally, and the developers pull the rug right from beneath you. This Colkhead, this terrifying creature of mysterious power, subjects links to his dark magic. We see Link in a dreamlike sequence being chased by Deku's groups, and he runs. He runs in horror. This is the hero of time, the avatar of the hero, the one holder of the Triforce of Courage, running away with his head on his hands. The cognitive dissonance is very strong, it should be obvious for any Ocarina of Time player that something is very wrong. And as Link screams in horror, he discovers that he has been transformed into a Deku scrub. How many times have you heard Link scream in horror in a Zelda game? This game wasn't just good at being slightly disturbing on its own, it magnifies this feeling by setting you up to expect Ocarina of Time 2 and then constantly doing something weird. God, I love this game! Link's transformation into a Deku scrub continues hammering this through several clever points. The one experienced, nimble and very confident Link is now in an uncomfortable body and out of his scope, and more importantly, so is the player. Deku Link moves weird, jumps poorly and has a hard time grabbing ledges, and has a set of abilities that just feels off or just worse compared to normal Link. Nothing works how you expect it to. Even the very first plans presented to the player as a way to test the new attack move immediately do a weird dance and vanish. They never do that in Ocarina of Time. Experienced Majora's Mask players will know that this means that this is a summon area for the Keaton, but that requires a special mask and there's no way for the player to return to this intro area once they have it, so why are those plans here? To reinforce the feeling that everything is familiar, but off. Even the things that seem the same work a bit differently, so you can't help but feel a bit of unease. Although the level coming up to Clock Town helps the player familiarize themselves with some of the new moves, by the time the Happy Mask Sailman is offering us a way to transform back into Helion, if we recover the Ocarina, the feeling has been established. Not a feeling of heading into the unknown, filled with adventure, but rather a feeling of being something that is familiar but just wrong. The opening hour of Clock Town reinforces this particularly well, as well as some of the other hidden horror themes of Majora's Mask, the idea of unacknowledged growth. From a plot perspective, Ocarina of Time was a game about a courageous child hero that is forced to suddenly grow up and see how the places that were once filled with childhood spirit are now dangerous and left to ruin. 
But that very same Link is then sent back to live life as a child. And while he might look similar, he definitely isn't. While Ocarina of Time and Shao Link might comically have a scene where he runs away from Gorons trying to hug him, Majora's Mask Child has no time or patience for your bullshit. <laughs> this is why the first three days that the player has to spend as Deku Link serve very well to set up this idea. Something that always strikes me as interesting is that the only character to give Link a hard time or deny him something because he's a Deku scrub are the Bombers. Almost every other instance of this happening in the initial three days are people who deny to sell, help or otherwise interact with Deku Link because he's a child. More interestingly, after those three hours when Link is able to recover his original form, none of these characters gave him any difficulty. This is interesting because when this Link was a child in Ocarina of Time, some characters will dismiss him for this very same reason, and eventually Ganondorf himself will take advantage of Link and Zelda's naiveness to take control of the Sacred Realm and the Triforce of Power. So even if the mechanical function of the character dismissing Deku Link as a child is to avoid the player getting into any side quests or main game content before they retrieve the Ocarina of Time, it also doubles as a way of setting players emotionally with the discomforting experience Lynx feels at being thrown into a world that he does not understand. By the time Link has recovered his original form, the player might be right there with him, siding with relief. The topic of Link's lost adulthood is deep and highly speculative, so I don't have time to go into a lot of it in a video about the first level, but if you found this curious and want to hear more, leave me a comment. So there's a lot to be said about the opening hours of Majora's Masks and Link's transformation to a Deku Scrub. While more traditional Zelda games use their first level to educate the players on their control systems or main mechanics, Majora's Masks works with the assumption that the player is experienced in the last game and uses that assumption to throw the player for a loop. It sets the tone for the darker, more uncomfortable and more adult story by putting the players in a position of discomfort and vulnerability. This is a Zelda game, but expect things to be different and weird. And it simultaneously set up the groundwork for more hidden narrative elements within the game, all while still providing some hints about the main time traveling mechanics that they will encounter further on. So what do you think? Do you find this game as special as many of us still do, or do you prefer when Zelda games stick closer to the established tone and spirit of other games? Let me know in comments.